There's news from heaven. Signs that you're being reborn. I want to look at, how do you know if anything's going well? What's, what's the point of life? How do I know what the score is? How do I know if I'm winning or losing? And if what do you expect if you're going on some kind of spiritual path? And when do we set our expectations too high for the kickbacks and feeling upgrades we think we would get from something like that? How does spiritual growth actually work? Is it like physical growth? These are the questions I want to get into with you. Thanks for hanging out. Like and subscribe. And see if we can't, just by turning our minds to the idea that there's, wait, there's, there's something higher up there. That there's a truth that although it's not always seen because it's relatively gentle, um, it holds within it the power to, if it gets in here, save us from all this other stuff that's trying to make us miserable all the time. Let's see if we can get any of that out of Secrets of Heaven 933. So you could download this book. It's no problem. It's free. Click the link there in the description. Follow along. It's a mighty, mighty scroll to get to 933, but it's worth it. We begin. Cold and heat symbolizes the condition of a person who is regenerating. Okay, right here. This is Swedenborg walking through the description of the Noah story. And this cold and heat, I don't know if you guys are familiar, but there was this thing that happened. There was a giant flood washed over the entire earth. It was a real problem for the inhabitants there. Check out last episode for a little bit of the symbolism of what that all meant. But at the end of it, you know, things are, the dry land is appearing. Okay, you've got Noah and some people starting up a new life here, and they're just starting to get ready and do the things that are going to allow humanity to continue. And God says, okay, I'm definitely not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to flood the whole earth. This stuff is not going to is going to always continue, the stuff that makes life life. But isn't this a little bit strange? Cold and heat? Especially this part, cold. Cold and heat will not cease. I, If you're trying to comfort me, just say it's always going to be warm. <laughs> it's actually here where I live. It's just starting to get towards winter, and it's nice, but it's also terrifying because you just remember, oh, it's just a drag when things are cold out. So why are you reassuring me, God, by saying, look, cold and heat, it's going to still be cold. Don't worry, it's going to still be cold. (laughs) This is giving us the realistic expectations for what spiritual growth is like. And And it allows us to know that even though I thought, hey, I thought I was doing well and I'm doing something and now I'm back here, that doesn't mean we're not progressing. Cold and heat symbolizes the condition of a person who's regenerating, which is, what's the condition of someone who's regenerating who is growing spiritually? The point of life is to regenerate. That's what we're doing. That Just like the point of physical life initially is you got to grow. Before you can go be a person that can try to accomplish things, you've got to get from a baby into a bigger baby, into a bigger baby, into a kid, and then I forget what comes after that. You've got to do that. You've got to grow. To get to be an eternal being, have a spiritual life, you know, get ready for the real thing, which is the life after this one, you got to regenerate. That's what we're doing here. So what's it like? Hey, I nailed it. I'm winning life because I am regenerating. What's that feel like? It's cold and hot toward the acceptance of faith and charity. Oh, this stuff, the stuff that God is trying to give everyone, the stuff that does, that's this very yellow stuff I was talking about here. What keeps out hell? What keeps out doubt and fear and misery and hostility? It's faith and charity. It's faith and love. It's the the truth and the motivation that taps into this idea that there is a greater cooperative, collaborative world out here and that there's a path to happiness that is not dependent on competition petition or negative dysfunctional attitudes towards other people. That's what it is. It's the faith and the charity. But when you're regenerating, even if you're doing the best thing we can be doing here, you alternate between cold and heat with the acceptance of faith. So lesson number one is no matter what, it's going to be winter sometimes. So the winter is not a sign that you're failing or that, that you're, it can be a part of being just where we need to be. Cold symbolizes no faith or charity, but heat symbolizes faith and charity. This can be seen from the symbolism of cold and heat in the word. 
which uses the terms to describe a person who is regenerating, or one who has regenerated, or the church. So this is, a, you know, all when we're on the way there, it's going to be hot and, hot and cold sometimes, and there's a miniature, miniature cycle of that in the day-night cycle. That's just how things go. Once we get there, whatever that is, you know, it's still, even angels, Swedenborg says, experience seasons. It's not as cold. They've moved a little farther toward the equator than we have when it's cold, but it's never that there's not times of contraction. This is, and it's fine because that's this essential part of how we grow. It's like when you exercise, there's going to be this period of discomfort. Otherwise, could, could, you know, would that really be any kind of experience? And, or the church, which is a thing in your heart and mind, but is also the aggregate of a bunch of people who are working to regenerate together. So, Whenever you see throughout, if you, if you go around reading the Bible, then whenever it's talking about heat and cold, it's talking about this fluctuation in us or in these different things. But you may have just heard me say the Bible and checked out of the conversation, or maybe you love it. Either way, you know what else is the word? The world. The earliest people saw in everything that exists on this globe. What continents are those? I don't know. The, the divine truth is written into all of it. So not only can you look at the text of the Bible and find this, this amazingly insightful treatise on what goes on in the heart and mind and what to expect, look at the world around you. Look at the way that heat and cold play a role in life. I, we were just referencing, yeah, it gets colder at night. You know, there's no light, there's no heat. And there are these seasons that shift in. You, that's the basic principle. You can go in there and just open your mind to that and study that what does it feel like to be warm after you've been cold? What does it feel like when, you, when you're first starting to feel the cold in winter? This is telling you about your own spiritual journey. That is like the miracle of correspondences, whether they're biblical correspondences or nature correspondences. It's saying that everything can be your teacher if you have the right if you're primed with the right uh, building blocks for that. And we're trying to give you those building blocks right now. That's not so bad. That's not, come on, that's not so bad. It can also be seen from the context above and below, which deals with the church. But you can read it yourself. The last verse said the people could no longer destroy themselves in the same way. The present verse says the church will always exist. First, depicting what happens when it comes into existence, that is, when a person is reborn as a church, and that you can be talking simultaneously about a church as a big group of people. And again, don't particularly think of religious institution, but think of a whole spiritual mindset. But also it's talking about simultaneously because they're the same thing. Just like you can talk in some ways about the way a, one individual in a population behaves versus how the whole population behaves. This, it's the same cycle. It's the same cycle. It's just like little electrons go around their atomic cores, just like the giant planets go around the giant stars. I'm a scientist. <laughs> okay. First, depicting what happens when it comes into existence. That is when a person is reborn as a church. That's us as well. And soon after, discussing the nature of a person who has already become regenerate. So it deals with every phase that people in the church pass through. What is this, this story, this strange story of Noah and the flood, which you may have major problems with, or you may have some kind of childhood affection for? Who knows? What's this actually talking about? This is talking about every phase that we go through when we're being reborn spiritually. There's only one really good way to see that when we are regenerating, we go through these phases of cold and heat or of faith and charity, absent and present. How do you tell, how do you back this up? That's through experience and through reflection on our experience. I can tell you about it. I can draw you terrible diagrams till my hands fall off, but you gotta look at your life you know, if you're really good at it, you can tell when you're in it, okay, this is just a period of cold, it'll get warm, but look back on things and try to find these cycles. And are, are, where, do, where do I see this in my life? That's the point at which, man, last episode we had this cool diagram of how there's these general principles and God speaks to you from those principles in individual ways for your individual mind. So I can say, look, there's, there's cold and heat, in your life as you're growing spiritually. And that can, okay, maybe that sounds like a, a, um, a cool principle. Maybe it doesn't. But 
it's the the sub thoughts from that there's per- specific perceptions that you're going to get as you think about your own life that's where the actual magic is that is where you're going to get insight to the reality of it that's how it is for me reading the Swedenborg stuff like sure there's sometimes the page is just like poetry and, and it's really helpful and I can just glue right to it but a lot of the magic for me happens I've got that idea and I start to uh, you can call it, think about it, but you're really just sitting there waiting for insights to come, focusing on it. And when those particular insights start to come, oh, that's what that means. That's where it's alive. And that's where it's saying, oh, yeah, the whole world is telling me the same story that you're hearing here in this cold and heat. Few people regenerate, though. <laughs> it's hard to do. And few of any of those who regenerate can or do reflect on the state of their regeneration. So let me say a few words about it. Hopefully more people now than a couple hundred years ago, but it's tough. It's a tough road, and it's even tougher to realize what you're in as you're in it. When, but this is, this is what it's like. When we are being reborn, we receive life from the Lord. Since up till then, we cannot be said to have been alive. We're alive in that we can, we're conscious and we can look around and do things and want things and feel things. But actually, a life that is run by love of self and love of the world. That when we are almost not really examining the quality of our motivations and the quality of our thoughts and just chasing after, really sort of being led by whatever urges we have, it's just autopilot. It's not, it's not real. It, it's, who was that? Socrates or somebody old. The unexamined life is not worth living. That there's an element of that, that, that sure, you're alive. I'm not trying to critique that too heavily, but there's a whole other level of life that we can get to. That when we get there, you feel like, oh, this is really life. And sometimes I'll get there for what I feel like is my own little version of there, just for brief periods. And I can say, like, this is what really matters. Man, the stuff I'm usually wrapped up in is so comic book and superficial. And this is maybe sort of what near-death experiences have when they get into this amazing other side of life and are saying, wow, everything else is is like fake compared to this. This is the real life that we're searching for. A life focused on the world and the body is not really life. Only a life that is heavenly and spiritual is real. That is actually what eternal life is. It's not just about eternal consciousness, but eternal consciousness, eternal focus on what's true and good rather than what's evil and false. We receive real life from the Lord through regeneration. I told you, This is important. This is what we're here to do. And since before that time we lack any life, we alternate between no life and true life. That is, between no faith or charity and some faith and charity. Here, cold symbolizes a lack of faith and charity and heat, the presence of some faith and charity. If this is a spiritual truth, it should be evident everywhere. If you're going to learn basketball, as this stick figure is about to learn, you know, you got your basketball and you're, you're dribbling, let's say you're really terrible, you know, like some of us are, basketball, and the first thing you got to do is start to work and practice, okay? And you're going to make some progress, but is it just like, okay, I'm learning, I'm learning, I'm learning, and now I'm good at basketball, and I stay good at basketball. Nothing works like that. You are going to learn some things and then do poorly and have off times and feel like you're losing skills and you're working up and everything you're improving gradually at. Even if you make leaps, everything everything else is this gradual thing. This is how it has to be for our progression spiritually. And even more so, think about, um, what am I going to draw? Think about biological stuff. Like you've got this whole pack of, let's say these are your cells in your, let's display Curtis's ignorance. Let's say these are your cells in your digestive tract somehow. And you're used to eating You know, let's say you eat a ton of something, sugar, which is fine. I eat sugar. It's fine. But let's say you say, I got to stop sugar because something's going on. And your cells are so used to getting this sugar that if you just stop, you're going to, I've known people who do that. You get headaches. It's really hard. And with some substances, you know, if you're, if you, if you've been, you know, using drugs that affect your, your neurotransmitters, you can really get sick. If you just stop them, right? And then people have to have something. You have to ease onto it. Just like if we are going around in our spiritual digestive tract, absorbing this stuff that Swedenborg says isn't really even alive, to suddenly acclimate ourselves to eat life instead, that takes time. So if you're going through things here and you're like, why? Look, I, 
I checked my spiritual check boxes. I read this cool thing. I'm working on something. I am consistent. Why is it that I'm fluctuating? So why am I still getting mad at so and so? And why am I? Why is it like this? Well, it's because everything's like that. Everything is like that. This is the situation. In case you want to know the situation, when we are caught up in bodily and worldly concerns, we experience a lack of faith and charity or coldness. This is what prompts those fluctuations, bodily and worldly concerns. And these are not just necessarily, oh, I'm hungry. This is also with the ego and materialism. He says, at such times, our bodily and worldly interests, and so our self-interest, are active. And, and it's just inescapable that at times, you got to have that in this world. It's just a product of having to navigate a reality where you've got to procure this stuff for life. So you're going to have that sometimes, and it's very hard also to not have the negative uh, sort of ego self-interest in there as well. It's almost unrealistic. I'd say unrealistic to expect that we're just going to be able to shut that out and it's never going to be there. That stuff is going to crop up, and when that stuff is taking over, that's going to be what triggers these states of cold. As long as we're wrapped up in them, we are devoid of or distant from belief in neighborly love. So we don't even think about heavenly and spiritual matters. Definitely happens. You can just sort of, even me, I go on and like, I have to think about this stuff because I have to try to talk about it, you know, multiple times a week. But in between, it's very easy to forget and then suddenly realize, oh yeah, there's this whole amazing world of these ideas that has treated me really well, but for some reason, there's this inertia towards just like, forget that stuff and just think superficially and wastefully. And it just is far, it's just what happens. Okay, the reason for the disconnection is that a heavenly focus and a bodily focus can never coexist in us since the human will is lost beyond recall. Here's the genetic reason for it, that there's sort of this progression in spiritual history of the human race has accumulated a bunch of love of self and love of the world, a bunch of negative stuff coming down through the era of time to our present condition. And as such, you know, you've got traits are passed, spiritual traits are passed through parents to kids over and over so that we end up, Swedenborg says, we end up with a corrupt will, which just, you see this in us, well, you know the human race, what am I drawing? Is this someone's head? I don't even know what's happening right now. This is the will, this is us. You see it just in the fact that the human race loves a lot of things that just are bizarre, and and, uh, and it's just way too prone to violence and negativity. Whoever you are, you, you see these giant places where it's like, why are people so bad? That is it, seeing it on the grand scale, in us, there's this strange phenomenon where we have a tendency toward and a pleasure in stuff that's bad, in doing things to other people that we wouldn't want done to ourselves. There's just this draw toward it. Isn't that strange? That's because we start out with a corrupt will. That's just how it is. It's not our fault. It's just how things get. This is why you can't just always have goodness and truth here, because this corrupt will, now pictured in red, is taking up so much space that you can't, it's got to take turns. This thing is so predatory and so voracious that sometimes it's got to feed, and sometimes this good stuff has got to feed. And they can't be in the same enclosure at the zoo at the same time because they can't get along. When our bodily desires and the urges of our will stop agitating and fall quiet, though, the Lord works through our inner self, and we then come into faith and charity which are called heat here. That the, just like there's conditions, like the earth is just, the part of the earth that you're on is just facing away from the sun. You just, the sun cannot get through the earth there to get to you. You've got to wait till it turns again. That us, these things not agitating anymore and falling quiet, that's our little world turning back to where love and truth can shine in on us. When we, re, when we return to a bodily focus, we go back into the cold. And when the body and everything connected with it fade away almost to the point of vanishing, we regain the warmth and so on in cycles. Swedenborg does make the point that what, this is why when some giant life event comes and really disrupts what we're doing, we come out the other side of it, often thinking deeply about you know, what really matters. We're looking up where before we were looking down and in sort of the daily grind and, and you know, superficial and small, when it's, we get a health scare or something like that, all that stuff falls away and we think, what's really important? 
This is part of the reason we go through things like that. Such is the human condition. Heavenly and spiritual values cannot coexist with bodily and worldly values in us, but must alternate with them. So, it's going to happen, and that's fine. I'd say, just knowing that this alternation is just a part of the process, that can make a difference too. Because instead of us seeing this alternation line here, and having despair that something is drastically wrong, we just know this is this is part of the process. This alternation has to happen, and doesn't mean I'm not on a good path. There are these are the things that take place in every regenerating person, lasting just as long as the process of regeneration does. There is no other way for us to be reborn. That's why I said it's got to happen. Or in other words, from from being dead to come alive. For the reason already given, our will is lost from beyond recall. Remember, this will is entirely separate from the new will that we will receive from the Lord, and that is the Lord's, not ours. This this little, you know, I may be even drawing this yellow thing too big for this, but this thing, this new will has got, just like you think about it, like a little baby developing or something, it's got all these little components in it that are very fragile and need the right conditions, and those have to be given time and space to grow. And in the meantime, this thing is keeping us alive. This negative old will, this is our life. We can't just pull it out at once or we would just die. You know, th this is our life. So it's this, this grafting process that's happening here. And it's slow and it's complicated. And it's just, it's a bummer, but it's what we do. And the end is going to be great. This is entirely, right, entirely separate from the new will. And that is the Lord's. Oh, and by the way, this new thing that's coming in is the Lord's, not ours. That's cool. Suddenly, you've outsourced your uh, perception machine to God. We, we get this direct link in to divine love and divine wisdom, which is this awesome lifestyle upgrade. All this now indicates what cold and heat symbolize here. Anyone who's been reborn can see from experience that this is how the matter stands. I don't know if, we, if I've been reborn or if you have, but apparently this stuff becomes more and more self-evident, or maybe we see it in little ways as we go through. That is to say, when bodily and worldly considerations absorb us, we are absent and distant from, from internal ones. Not only do we fail to think about them, but we also sense a kind of chill inside us. When bodily and worldly demands quiet down, on the other hand, we come under the influence of faith and charity. This chill, this chill right here, ooh, I was trying to chill it in blue. That chill, for me, as you maybe have guessed, I get my what I feel like are my spiritual nutrients, a lot from Swedenborg's material. There are times when I feel like that is the last thing I want to walk into is, is Swedenborg stuff. Ugh, I'd rather look at this other stuff on my phone. That is just a state of mind you get into. And even though the actual experience of, for me of being in this is almost always positive, there's just a resistance to it. No, I don't want to do that. And it's, that's not unique to spiritual or religious sort of text because isn't that the same thing with trying to clean up the kitchen oh i just i just can't take starting to do these dishes right now but it's almost always as soon as i'm doing them i feel like oh wait a second this is great this is getting me in a better state of mind it's the same sort of thing but but there's times when i'm just too in that other state that i just can't even get into it and do it or if there are times when you try to get in it and it's just not happening there's going to be this chill, but the chill, no chill lasts forever. It's always going to be morning, and then we'll be back, and we'll be ready to go. Such an individual can also see from experience that these two phases alternate. So when bodily and worldly concerns start to overflow and try to dominate, we enter a period of distress and trial. The crisis lasts until we have been reduced to a state in which our outer self obeys our inner self. An obedience that is utterly impossible except when the outer self grows and still and almost vanishes. What is the point? When do we, when have we regenerated? It's when the outer self doesn't die, doesn't go away, but it obeys the inner self. When this thing here grows up enough that even though we've still got this will in us, it is realizing actually life is better when we live from these higher principles. That this thing here is calling the shots and this thing is listening. And the more these two work as a partnership, the better that we go. Because good doesn't want to destroy evil. It just wants to save and show evil. Look, here's how you can work in a system that works. 
same little thing happening inside us, and that's the news from heaven. Hopefully that helps. Is that of any comfort to you? Let me know in the comments. Please write it out. What do these ideas do for you? Are they actually making life better? We'd love to hear that. Like and subscribe. Support us. Also, otlemonthly.cosvox.com. That is the way that we, if we as a nonprofit, the only way we can do stuff like this is if you decide to support us financially. And if you do that on a regular basis, we can know going forward, this is what we're capable of doing. It's really great for us. Thanks to everyone who has contributed. And thanks for sitting and watching this uh, episode. And I, I appreciate the community space we create where we get to think through these ideas, hear from, uh, we love hearing from you by that, refining the ideas. And hopefully we're creating more and more potent tools to lift us up and out of whatever we're doing and the kind of stuff we can take and then hand to somebody and say, look, this can help your life because that's the point of all this and that's the point of regeneration. So good luck to you on your journey. Even if you're going up and down, that's good. That's fine. And keep at it because every bit of work we do inside ourselves is a service to the human race because it makes us better able to serve and do what needs to be done. Hope you have a good week.